The Messianic era will be one of seismic changes that will reverberate the world over. As the verse says, on that day, God will be one and his name will be one. There will be universal acceptance of God and his dominion, of course, for the Jewish people will be lauded and accepted as God's chosen people. The temple will will be rebuilt. The Jewish people will be gathered from all their exiles, both spiritually and geographically. The laws will be restored, sacrifices, the laws of the calendar. The Davidic line will be restored. King Messiah will reign. And this will be a spiritual renaissance for the entire world. Messiah's impact will be worldwide, not just for the Jewish people, but for everyone. And there's going to be an unquenchable thirst for knowledge of God. As the verse says, there will be hunger, not for bread. There will be thirst, not for water, only to hear the word of God. And again, this revolution, this renaissance is for the Jewish people and for all the nations. And it's interesting, if you study the subject, you'll discover that the impact that Messiah and the Messianic era has on the nations, it's not just some side point of Messiah, perhaps the primary point of Messiah, it's not for our people, it's not for the Jewish nation, it's for the Gentiles. Messiah will be a world where everyone recognizes God. And what do you know? We've been there for a few millennia already. We already had the Sinai revelation. We've already seen the Almighty's complete dominion. As we mentioned in the past, the Talmud says that the only difference between this world and the world of Messiah is the subjugation to foreign rulers. For us, the Talmud is minimizing the impact that Messiah will have. After all, we already had our Sinai revelation. The revelation of Messiah, for us, will be relatively minimal. If you look at the, perhaps the most famous verse in the Torah, Shema Yisrael, hear O Israel, Hashem Elokeinu, Hashem is our God, Hashem Echad. You look at the comment of Rashi from our sages. Rashi says, hear O Israel, Hashem is our God. Today, i.e. after Sinai, after the Exodus, after we were selected selected to be God's nation, Hashem is our God. But in the future, in the Messianic era, well then, God will be one. There will be universality for what we, we were already accepted. At Sinai, we already achieved closeness to God. We already committed ourselves to Him. That's Hashem Elokeinu. Hashem is our God. But with Messiah, that goes global. And thus, you can even say that the primary impact of Messiah is not on the Jewish people, it's on the nations. Now, with regards to King Messiah himself, our Shadis tell us that he will rule over the entire world. The entire world will submit themselves to him. The nations will bring tributes to him. The Gentile nations that have spent many centuries and millennia maligning the Jewish people will accept them and their leader. When we talk about Messiah, we're in a very different world than the world that we're used to, the world that we've become accustomed to since the inception of our nation 3,500 years ago. Messiah is a very different world. Now, if you look at the prayers for Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, the, the centerpiece of the High Holiday prayers, it's all about describing what this world of Messiah looks like. We're praying, we're petitioning, we're entreating upon God to usher in this era. And look at the description. We ask the Almighty to place his fear upon all of his creations and to place his dread on everything that you created and let your awe be on all the things that 
you brought about. And let all the creations bow before you. Everything that God created, all of his handiwork, will submit themselves to him. And everything will create a union to try to fulfill the will of God. The whole world will get together, will coalesce to try to figure out how do we worship God properly. Continues the prayer. We, we've already been there. We already know this principle that you have all the dominion and all the strength is yours. But now that's going to go universal for everyone else. And that's going to bestow honor to your nation. And that will provide praise for those who fear you. And that will provide good hope for those who seek you. This is a translation of the prayer that we say on Rosh Hashanah and Kippur. And that will give a voice for those who yearn for you. And that will bring joy to your land and jubilation to your city. And David's pride will blossom And there will be a light for the descendant of Jesse, your Messiah, speedily in our days. And the righteous, they'll see, and they'll be joyous. And those who are upstanding and pious, they will sing. And all evil shall have its mouth sealed, and all wickedness will be banished like smoke. For you shall remove the evil dominion from the land. So we're describing this world is very radically, materially different than our world. All evil is banished. All wickedness is gone like a puff of smoke. Continues the prayer. You will rule alone from Mount Zion in Jerusalem. From your holy city. Quotes the verse. Yimloch Hashem le'olam. God will rule forever. So this is a picture of a very different world, a very elevated world, a refined world. The evil is all banished. The wickedness is all dispelled. The evil empire is removed. And we talk about the pride of David and Messiah and Jerusalem and Mount Zion, the light of the son of Jesse. And the righteous will sing, and the upstanding will exult, and the the pious will be delighted. And the whole world will come to know God and accept his dominion. This is the Messianic era as described in our liturgy. Now, there's one word or this one statement, one phrase that's used in our prayers elsewhere to describe this. And we say this every day. Multiple times in the Aleinu prayer, we're asking God, Litakain Olam Bimalchut Shakai, to fix the world with the kingdom of God. Now, a quick sidebar the concept of Tikkun Olam, i.e., fixing the world, today it's used colloquially to mean something else. It means kind of progress in a, in a social or political sense, but less in a religious sense. Originally, the earliest instance of this phrase, it says, olam, to fit the world with the kingdom of God, to make the knowledge of God more ubiquitous. Later on, to be fair, in the Mishnah, the term was used for edicts and decrees that ensure that Torah will be properly observed. But the principal idea of this concept, tikkun olam, is that the world is broken. There's something fundamentally wrong with our world. And the problem is, is that the kingdom of God is not not present. The presence of God, the creator of the world, the only real power and force in the world, God is obscured. In his world. God sees, but is unseen. And the objective of Messiah is to fix that, to restore the kingdom of God. And with Messiah, this world will be fixed, will arrive at its perfection, at its completion. All the heresy will be eliminated from the world. The evil will cease to be present. Wickedness 
will be no longer. And there's going to be a thirst for God. And yes, the material and physical abundance will be present to facilitate that. But people won't be interested in that. Our our focus is going to be on the matters of the of the spirit, of of the of the soul. And everything will be orchestrated and coordinated to facilitate that we could we could study Torah and we could pursue knowledge of God. Now on, on a deeper level, we discover in the literature that part of Messiah's role is to reveal the spiritual dimension of everything in existence. Today, people can even doubt the existence and dominion of God. People today can quibble with the notion that there's spirituality at all. But even people who do accept the concept of spirituality can can separate. Well, there, there's the realm of the physical and there's the realm of the spiritual and they don't really have a touch point. We believe that actually there's a spark of holiness in everything. And we look in the literature, the literature is clear that Messiah, part of what Messiah will do is to demonstrate that there's spirituality in everything. We say in our prayers that part of what Messiah is going to do is to kind of remove that fallacy that spirituality is kind of something which is relegated to the cosmos, to the heavens. There is nothing besides you, our Redeemer, we tell God, in the days of Messiah. In the times of Messiah, we'll discover that there's spirituality in everything, So, for example, Psalms 96, the nations will declare that the Lord is king and the heavens will rejoice and the sea will thunder and the fields will sing and the forests and the trees will yelp for joy. This is not hyperbole. Part of what Messiah is going to do is to reveal the spiritual dimension in all of creation. Isaiah 55, for example, and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. The Messianic era will be one where the spiritual dimension is completely undeniable. Now we have a picture of what this looks like already. In the book of Genesis, we read how Jacob had to escape from his brother. He had to usurp the blessings. And then Esau wanted to kill him, and he had to escape. And he escapes, and he spends the night on Temple Mount. And he places some stones around his head. And then Rashi notes, the Talmud notes, that in the morning, when he wakes up, those stones have morphed into a single stone. And Rashi quotes from the Talmud, from the Midrash, that the stones in the middle of the night were jostling and jockeying with each other. Each one of them wanted it to be the pillow upon which the righteous places his head. What does this mean? So our sages tell us, even inanimate objects like rocks, they too have some sort of spiritual spark animating them. And Jacob was someone who lived with such a, an enlightened and, and elevated stature that around him, the spiritual dimension was, was so palpable that even the lowliest of items like stones, even they were operating as spiritual entities. And they wanted to be more spiritual and they wanted to fulfill their highest use case to serve as a, as a pillow, as a support for Jacob. Now today, outside of Jacob, such an idea of, of, of rocks being spiritual, it doesn't really exist. But for Jacob, as an individual, he had that level of living. When Messiah comes, 
that's going to happen the world over. So we're talking about a very different world. The Messianic era, Messiah, will be a completely elevated world. And to give this, you know, some cosmic context, we talked about this already. From the time that Messiah comes until the year 6,000, Messiah needs to fix the whole world. This has to be a time of remarkable and accelerated spiritual transformation. When you read the literature, it's, it's clear that Adam, prior to his sin, was this pristine creation of such lofty holiness that even the angels, they thought or they mistook Adam for God. Now, what would have happened had Adam not sinned? Imagine that counterfactual world. Adam's sin doesn't happen. He doesn't do it. And he arrives at Shabbos, because Adam's created on on Friday, of course. But let's say he arrives at Shabbos free of sin. This is an interesting question to ponder. And I say, just tell us something quite dramatic. This is found in Das Tvunas, Ramchal, and elsewhere. Messiah is the world, or is a description of the world, that would have been had Adam not sinned. Think of, of Adam. Let's imagine Adam didn't sin, and he arrived at Shabbos free of any taint that is Messiah. The work of this world is finished. Now, of course, Adam Adam did sin. And as a result, the Almighty says, okay, I'm going to give humanity another chance. Instead of those six days to attain perfection, now we're given six millennia to do it. And we have to arrive at the end of the six millennia perfected. This shows us what, what Messiah has to accomplish. He has to reverse, he, but also the Messianic era, has to reverse and undo the sin of Adam. And not just that, not just to attain parity with Adam, but to do better. Adam was not able to, to arrive at the finish line. He wasn't able to or was unwilling to. The Messianic era must conclude with arriving at year 6,000 with total perfection. This is all a long way of saying that Messiah, it's a very dramatically different world. It's a radically different world than the one that we currently inhabit. And the question that I want to ponder next is, how is all this going to happen? How will such dramatic changes transpire? What's going to trigger all these changes? What is the mechanism or mechanisms by which all these very dramatic transformations occur? Messiah arrives. Well, how does it change everything? What about Messiah and the Messianic era effectuates such drastic transformation? What is the means by which Messiah and the Messianic era radically reform the world and upgrade it and elevate it, not just the world in general, but all the inhabitants of the world? This is already the, the next level of study of this subject. So we have a description of of what Messiah is, but how does that happen? This is not an easy question to answer. For one, you could say, well, given that we are in the the pre-Messiah era, maybe there are multiple different paths that we can go down. Maybe there's different ways that this can 
unfold. Prior to Messiah, well, maybe there are more than one ways that this can play out. Maybe the the destination of Messiah, we, we saw this already in the past, and we'll talk more about this extensively, please God, in the future. The destination is fixed. Messiah has to happen. But perhaps there is a multiplicity of potential means by which we arrive at that goal. So maybe we can't give a definitive answer to this question. Point number one. Another important point, something we already addressed, and we'll talk about it, of course, more in the future, please, God. Messiah is something which is portrayed both as a revelation, something that happens suddenly, something that appears instantly, but it's also a process. Dhamma tells us that this 6,000-year world is divided into three main epochs. And the final 2,000 years is the epoch of Messiah. And this further complicates our pursuit, you know, the Messiah, or at least some elements of Messiah, it transpires over time. And therefore, it's going to be hard for us to pinpoint what exactly is triggering what, what's the cause and the effect. Now, to make matters more opaque and uncertain, Rambam himself, he told us that the the order of things and what will happen and when will things happen and how exactly it will all play out, that is all something that we don't really know. So, for example, he talks about this apocalyptic war. Melchem is gogu magog. The way the Rambam introduces that subject, it says, well, it appears from the simple words of the prophets that there's going to be some sort of war at the beginning of the days of Messiah. And it appears that before this war, well, then the prophet will come to straighten the Jews and prepare their hearts. And some of the sages say that Elijah will precede Messiah. The Ramah is not taking definitive stances on what will prompt all these drastic changes of Messiah. And then he adds, well, in all of these matters, we don't know what will happen until it happens. And even the prophets did not see these matters clearly, and we don't have a tradition from our sages. And that's why this matter is so hotly disputed. And don't worry about it. Don't worry about the fact that you don't know precisely what's going to happen because the precise details are not a principle in our religion. It wasn't known to the prophets. It wasn't known to the sages. We're not trying to claim that what we can present is going to be authoritative. But nevertheless, if you look through the sources, they lay out a variety of factors that will play some role in bringing about, in effectuating the grand transformation of Messiah. So even if we can't say with definitiveness, with authoritativeness, what the precise cause and effect will be and how it will all go down, we can talk about the various changes that will transpire, that will influence the whole world. And specifically, I want to discuss four different variables that I found in my research that will play a role in reshaping the world and fixing it and elevating it in the Messianic era. Now again, what comes first and what comes second and what it looks like, there's a lot about this that we don't know. We did see Ramchal who told us that Messiah's first job is to fix the Jewish people and then that's going to fix everything else, the whole world and the rest of its inhabitants. So we do know a little bit, but let's talk about these four, or let's lay out these four variables, because if we understand them, 
It's going to give us a better picture about what the mechanism of Messiah is. Our saints tell us there's going to be an elimination of evil in the times of Messiah. In that prayer that we mentioned earlier, it talks about the evil empire and the the evil and the wickedness disappearing like a puff of smoke. The Talmud talks about how the Yetzirah, the evil inclination, is going to be eliminated or eradicated or destroyed in some way. Now, if that was the only variable that changes, we can now understand how the world's going to change. Because, well, if this is the force that gets us to blunder, this is the force, this is the factor that gets us to ignore God. The Yetzirah is the foreign god in Jewish literature. And thus, if you remove the foreign god, well, what's going to be restored? God will be restored. And thus, this can be a mechanism by which the world changes. You remove the Yetzirah from the equation, suddenly we're, we're like Adam prior to the sin. Adam prior to the sin? Well, it's like an angel, just way more loftier. That's the first variable that we have to study. The second variable is Messiah himself. When you look at the literature, when it talks about Messiah and the force of personality and the power and the prophecy, a prophecy on par with Moshe, wisdom that exceeds the wisdom of Solomon. Messiah as the individual, that's going to unleash a global reckoning that such a person can exist, that we can also understand will change the whole world. A third variable, and that is miracles. The Ramah says, well, if there's this war of Gogu Madru, it's not a war like we've ever seen before. According to the Gona Vilna, it's a three-hour war. Most of the world's destroyed. That war, and we'll talk more about it, please, God, it's a war that's going to have a lot of miracles to it. And miracles have a way of changing people. We talk about the arrival of prophets. The saints talk about something akin to the Exodus. If something like that is revealed, we can see how it's going to change the whole world. And finally, we have many, many references to repentance surrounding Messiah. A national and even a global outpouring of a desire, of a sincere desire to return to God. Now, whether that will be some sort of imminent awakening or will that be spurred by outside factors? I don't know. But we do read about a repentance movement sweeping through the nation and eventually rippling throughout the whole world. And this too, of course, can serve as a catalyst for the messianic transformation. Now, there may be other factors that we will discover in our research, but here we have compiled four potential mechanisms or catalysts or impetuses that can change the entire ballgame for humanity. And I think if we're going to understand the concept of Messiah better, we need to understand what are the elements, what are the factors, what are the variables that are present in the Messianic time, at one point or another, that are going to lead to this radically reshaped world. Now, today we're going to cover these very briefly, just go through some of the sources, and then we will, please God, explore them in depth, one at a time. So the first factor that we mentioned is the eradication of evil. In the times of Messiah, evil will be eliminated. The Yetzirah will be eliminated or or mitigated or ameliorated or reformed to some degree. And that, of course, can change, can change everything. This is featured in the Torah. 
in the Torah section that talks about Messiah, chapter 30 of the book of Devarim. It talks about the circumcision of the heart. Umal Hashem God will circumcise your heart. Those blockages that inhibit our heart will be removed. Now, what does that mean? So the Ramban, others, they say this is a reference to the eradication of the evil inclination. The evil inclination kind of clams up our heart. If you remove that, our heart just yearns for God. We're like King David, just yearning for God all the time. We have a verse in Scripture, in in the Torah, in Devarim. Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 6, it talks about God circumcising the heart and exposing our heart. And then we will love Hashem our God with all our heart and with all our soul. This idea is found elsewhere in our Torah and Tanakh. The book of Ezekiel chapter 36, I will give you a new heart. That old heart that was covered up, I'll give you a new one and a new spirit I will place inside of you. And I'll remove the stone heart from your flesh and I will replace it with a fleshy heart. And my spirit I will place amongst you. And then you will be naturally inclined to follow my ways. And again, our status tells us this is a reference to the removal of the evil connection in the times of Messiah. Now, this concept has some interesting consequences. The Talmud tells us, again quoting a verse, this time in Ecclesiastes chapter 12, there are days upcoming, there are years upcoming that are bereft of Desire. Days with no merit and no guilt, no righteousness and no wickedness. One of the consequences of a lack of desire, of a lack of an inclination for evil is that, well, <laughs> the merit that we have today is because we have to overcome. We do a mitzvah, we have to overcome the Yitzhara. If there's no Yitzhara, it's a day's with no righteousness, no wickedness, and no desire, there is going to be a limitation, a curbing of how much we can earn on our own because now we have nothing pushing in the opposite direction. We don't face any resistance and therefore what we can acquire on our own is actually lessened, is minimized in the times of Messiah. Now, the Talmud, in the book of Sukkah, on page 52a, gives a very dramatic description of the slaughtering of the Yitzhahara. In the future, the Almighty will bring the Yitzhahara and slaughter it in front of the wicked and in front of the righteous. And to the righteous, it will appear to them as a large mountain. And to the wicked, it will appear to them as a strand of hair. And both will be crying, both groups. The righteous will be crying, and they say, how did we overcome this mountain? And the wicked will be crying, and they'll say, well, how did we succumb to this lowly strand of hair? Now, again, this, the Talmud does not explicitly say that this is the description of what happens in the times of Messiah. But if you look at the Talmud in its context, it, it's perhaps implied that this is the description of what's going to happen in the times of Messiah. But regardless, we do see, again, the concept of this divine eradication of evil. And of course, we need to understand, you know, what's the nature of this elimination of the Yitzhara and what are the implications. But certainly, if this happens, that would clearly pave the way for the radical changes of the Messianic era. The next factor that can serve as a mechanism for Messiah 
is Messiah himself. If you look at our stories and our history, it's really one of individuals. You read Genesis. It's focusing on individuals. Who's changing the tide of history? It's Abraham. Abraham arriving. And then in the book of Exodus, we read about Moshe. And Abraham is single-handedly introducing the concept of monotheism to a, a pagan world. And Moshe, one man, bringing such dramatic and unprecedented change. And King David, what one person can accomplish. This unparalleled individual with, with an august and lofty soul. And he's the king of the Jewish people. And Chistia, of course, and the great sages of the Mishnah and Talmud, and Rashi, what he did for us, and the Rambam, and the Shulchan Aruch, etc. Messiah, it's one person, the individual. But a person with such a powerful soul that just totally changes everything. We have in our history, examples of what this looks like, how the entire world can be transformed in a material way by one person. And this too is part of the messianic transformation, like Abraham, changing the trajectory of humanity. Like Moshe, one person going up and battling with the angels and bringing Torah down from heaven. And now we're waiting for Messiah. The one person who can change the whole world. That's the second factor. And then there's the third factor. And that's the miracles. The upcoming redemption. That's part of a line of redemptions that we have already experienced. You know, the the story of the Exodus in Egypt. Our Satanists tell us that serves as a template for all future redemptions. And just as was the case with the Exodus from Egypt, the future redemptions will be accompanied by miracles. And of course, miracles that can change how people understand the world. So we talked about already the war, Gog and Magog, something very dramatic will happen. As we shall yet see, In the times of Messiah, there is the first resurrection, not to be confused or conflated with the second and ultimate resurrection in times of Olam Abba, but the miracles of Messiah will also contribute towards this grand renaissance, this grand transformation that will usher the whole world to perfection. And finally, the fourth major factor is repentance. Repentance is always associated and connected with the redemption and Messiah. When the Torah introduces the subject of Messiah in chapter 30 of Devarim, it begins with repentance. The last day of Moshe's life, He gathers the nation, those who are present, those who are not present, and he makes a covenant binding the people to God and to his Torah. And of course, we read about all the concomitant consequences thereof. And we read about how the nation can get expelled, part of the consequences. And what's going to be when all these blessings and curses befall them? Chapter 30 begins, the nation will be in a foreign land, and they will return. Repentance. The nation will return to God and listen to his voice and hearken to his words. And they'll return to him with all their heart and all their soul. And then the Almighty says, okay, you return to me. I will return to you. And God will gather us from amongst all those nations that we were 
dispersed him. We could be at the furthest ends of the heaven. From there, God will gather us, and from there he will take us. And he'll bring us back to the land that our forefathers inherited. And we will inherit it. And the Almighty will do good to us and will increase us more than our forefathers. And then the aforementioned verse, and God will circumcise our heart and the heart of our descendants to love Hashem our God with all our hearts and with all our souls. And all those curses that we were threatened with, the Almighty will place them on our enemies and on our haters who have pursued us. And then read verse 8. Again, we will return and repent. And we will hearken to the voice of Hashem. And we will do all of his mitzvos. And then again, we read about how the Almighty will make us great and will have prosperity and our children and our livestock and our produce will all be increased. And God will delight over us as he delighted over our forefathers. Because we'll listen to the voice of Hashem, our God, observe his mitzvot, his statutes that are written in the Torah, and we again will return to Hashem, our God, with all our hearts and soul. We have 10 verses here that talk about the Messianic era. And three times we read about how the nation is awakened to repentance. It starts off where in the lands of others, we're in exile and bad things are happening to us and then there's repentance. And then we go back to the land and good things are happening to us and then there's repentance. And then sensational things are happening to us and then there's even more repentance. Our saints tell us, repentance is always associated with redemption and Messiah. So for example, Isaiah 59, this is of course a part of the prayers. Uval and Roel, to Zion will come the Redeemer, Ula Shave Pesha Byakov. And penitence from sin will exist in Jacob. The Talmud tells the book of Yoma, page 86b. Repentance brings the redemption near. And it quotes this verse. When will the Redeemer come to Zion? Why will the Redeemer come to Zion? Because there are penitents amongst Jacob. We have the unforgettable Talmud. And this is something that we'll, we'll yet revisit. The Talmud tells of one of the great sages who met Elijah. The prophet and angel Elijah was by the entrance of the burial cave of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. And they start chatting. And the great rabbi, Rabbi Shubham Levi, says, well, will I be able to see the world to come? So Elijah responds with maybe a little bit less reassurance than the great rabbi was hoping for. He says, well, if the Holy One, blessed is he, if he, if he wants it, then you'll see the world to come. But the conversation <laughs> continues. Listen to this. It gets even stranger. Rabbi Shubham Levi says to Elijah, well, when will Messiah come? So Elijah clearly knows the answer. He says, well, don't ask me. Go ask him. Go ask him. Go find Messiah and go ask him. Don't, don't ask me this question. Well, where is he? So Elijah reveals to Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi where Messiah is. He's at the entrance of Rome. If you go to the entrance of Rome, you'll find him. But there's a lot of people at the entrance of Rome. How do I figure out which one of those people's Messiah? Well, here's how you identify him, says Elijah. There's a group of people sitting at the entrance of Rome who are ill and have skin maladies and they have all these bandages covering themselves up 
And all of those people, they remove all the bandages and they replace them all at once. But there's one person there, says Elijah. He doesn't take off all the bandages and replace them all at once. He does one at a time, removes one bandage, replaces that one and removes the next one and replaces that one. And the reason why he does that is because, well, Messiah comes, he doesn't want to be with no bandages, so he has to always be ready to jump on the train or on the donkey to go to Jerusalem to go save humanity. And therefore, he just, he has this unusual bandage practice. He removes one and replaces it one at a time. Okay, now he knows where to go, where to find Messiah. So the great rabbi leaves the land of Israel and travels to Rome. And he goes to the outskirts of the city and he sees one one person who is tying and untying, wrapping and unwrapping his wounds in this fashion. And he walks over to him and says, well, nice to meet you, Messiah. And uh, Messiah responds to him, well, nice to meet you, Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi. He gets to the point and he says, okay, well, when are you coming? When are you coming? So he responds with maybe the best answer. The best answer with one word. Hayom. Hayom. Today. He's so excited. He's over the moon. Messiah's coming today. He rushes back to be ready. And of course, that day comes and goes. And Messiah doesn't arrive. So the rabbi is not so happy. And sometime later, he once again meets Elijah. So Elijah asks him, well, as per our earlier conversation, as per our conversation, what did Messiah tell you? So he says, well, he lied to me. He didn't tell the truth. He said, Hayom, today. He didn't come. So Elijah explained, this is what he said. The verse tells us in Psalms 95, verse 7, Hayom, in Bekolo Tishmo. Today, if you listen to his voice. You only heard the first part of his answer, Hayom, which means today. But there is a condition What's the condition for Messiah coming today? In Bekol Tishmo, if you listen, if you hearken to God's words. When will Messiah come? Today. In Bekol Tishmo, if we return to God, if we hearken to his words, then Messiah will come that day. Now, I want to note that that Talmud it's going to be important for us in our studies, not just for this point that Messiah is associated with repentance, but what does it mean that he's sitting outside the gates of, of Rome and that he has these skin maladies and that he's tying and untying? All that, of course, we've already been trained to know that that's an organic Talmud. We have to understand what that means. But certainly, we see that Messiah and redemption is connected to repentance. And the Talmud says this plainly and clearly. If Israel repents, they will be redeemed. If they don't, they will not be redeemed. Very clear. Messiah will be a time of significant change. The world will be fixed with the kingdom of God. On that day, God will be one and his name will be one. In this era, before the year 6000, we will need to restore humanity back to the way things were prior to Adam's sin. But we even have to surpass Adam, unlike Adam who, in fact, sinned and caused the world to become corrupted. Messiah will need to have that perfection and not allow corruption to happen. And the whole world is going to be radically changed and upgraded. How will all this happen? We spoke about four primary elements that will cause this very dramatic and radical change in the world. We spoke about the concept of the elimination of evil. 
We spoke about the persona of Messiah, this towering soul that's able to really move the needle. We spoke about the miracles that accompany the Messianic era. And finally, we spoke about national repentance that really changes the hearts of the nation. Now, our mission is to study these four elements, these four aspects of the Messianic revolution in depth. And hopefully, please God, get a greater understanding on how the renaissance of Messiah will unfold. I look forward to your questions, your comments, and your feedback. As always, send me an email, rabbiwalby at gmail.com. I look forward to hearing from you.